Paul Brideshell. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. You can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash Show. All right, you guys, on the line, I've got Daniel Lazar. He is our newest regular contributor to antiwar.com, I'm so happy to say. And uh, his very latest is called Erdogan's Excellent Syrian Adventure. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Dan? I'm just fine. How are you, Scott? I'm doing great. Appreciate you joining us today here. So uh, there's so much going on. Um, And uh, so, first of all, people need to understand... Uh, where and what is the importance of the Idlib province in the Syrian war? Can we start there, please, sir? Yeah, let's, let's, let's start there. First of all, the thing to know is that the situation is exploding. Uh, um, uh, Erdogan is pouring in reinforcements. Uh, he's exchanging fire not only with uh, Syrian government troops, but apparently uh, with Russian forces as well. So we got a real serious situation there, which is blowing out of control. Uh, it's, uh, it's something. Um, secondly, Idlib is a province in uh, northwestern Syria, which abuts the, uh, the Turkish border. Uh, and as such, it's been a, an entry point for uh, Syrian rebels, so-called, uh, since the civil war there started in 2011. And uh, in 2014, and especially in the spring of 2015, uh, the uh, rebels, uh, who are led by al-Qaeda, the same folks who blew up the World Trade Center uh, on uh, 9-11, al-Qaeda armed with with, uh, uh, U.S.-made, Saudi-supplied tow missiles and backed by Turkey invaded Idlib province and essentially took it over uh, from the Syrian army. Um, And since uh, last April, April 2019, uh, uh, the Syrian government has mounted a counteroffensive to drive uh, um, uh, the rebels led by al-Qaeda out of the province. And they have been very successful. Uh, and in mid-December, they launched a uh, stage two of that offensive, and that's gone even more rapidly than the previous stage. So as the, um, as the, uh, the uh, offensive has advanced, uh, Turkish uh, positions have come under fire from the Syrian government, and therefore all hell is breaking loose. Um, so uh, for, uh, for, for um Nine years now, eight or nine years now, uh, outside par- parties have been feasting on the on the poor, broken carcass of Syria. Uh, but now the uh, they're coming to blows with one another, and uh, the situation seems to be like exploding. And it looks like we have a serious war on our ha- our hands. Man, I'll tell you the part that I like the least, and that is that it was Russian warplanes that intervened and forced an end to the fighting here, which put a NATO ally, Turkey, in conflict or almost in direct conflict with Russia, Dan. Well, it isn't direct conflict. I mean, it's Turkish, it's Turkish troops that are coming under fire from Russian uh, military aircraft. So there's a direct exchange of fire. Uh, it's uh, it's really serious. Oh, so the Russians did. Oh, I see now. They did actually launch strikes. I was thinking they just maybe did one of them Top Gun flyby things and told everybody to shut up. But no, it was worse. No, no, it's not. It's a, it's it's a pretty serious conflict. And the, yeah, and yeah, the Russians are providing air support to the uh, to the Syrian government. Mm-hmm. And and legally, legally, the Syrian government has uh, has every right to uh, to ask for support. From whatever outside party it wants, uh, when the Spanish Republic was, you know, was under assault in 1936, the Spanish Republic appealed for international support uh, and got it from from the Soviet Union and, interestingly enough, from the Turkish Republic. Uh, so, uh, so what's happening now in Syria is, legally speaking, no different. Man, and if anybody in D.C. wants to do anything to try to 
resolve this or, you know, tone down the conflict between the major powers here, for example, by leaning on the Turks to back off something like that, then, well, they're just Russian traitor Kremlin <laughs> stooges, which Donald Trump is a Russian asset is trending again right now as we speak on Whoa. Twitter here at the end of February 2020, almost a year after it was over, it's already on again. And well, so I guess that makes you Putin's agent, too, since you know better than all this crap. Uh, and you, too. But um, but but as we know, the uh, CIA has informed uh, Adam Schiff that the, uh, the that the Russian government is once again intervening in the uh, U.S. elections and Donald Trump's uh, support. Yeah. So which so is it must be true. It must be true. Right. But I mean, it really. Yes, it's of course. Added, I mean, they just take it added, absolutely at face value that, hey, if you say so, I can't remember you getting anything wrong recently, FBI. Uh, that, not, certainly added, not on this issue. Uh, if Adam, so if Adam Schiff says it, you got to believe it, right? Yeah, man. So, but I mean, it really means that, I mean, here, I don't know, when was the last time we had the Russians actually bombing and killing members of a NATO allied state? Like a how about never? And so, well, I, I'm I, sorry, I, I, I'm just I, behind I, on this. Do you know if Trump is doing anything? He's sending anybody anywhere to talk with Lavrov or what the hell is going on here? Yes, yes, he has. He has, He has. Uh, um, I think it was last Saturday, uh, Erdogan gave him a call. Uh, and uh, on the phone call, Trump expressed sympathy and, uh, and, uh, ex and conveyed his, <coughs> excuse me, conveyed his feelings that Russia should stop what it's doing. But let you know. But 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 Turkey has invaded Syria. It is occupying Syrian territory. Uh, yet it insists on labeling Syria as the aggressor. But sorry, that's not the way it works. Syria is the defender, uh, and um, and and to label the aggressor is to turn turn reality on its head. Well. <laughs> And I mean, I know that Trump, as far as I know, that this was real because, you know, I talked with other people who confirmed this later. It wasn't just The Washington Post said so that in uh, what, June of 2017, when Pompeo was still at CIA, that Trump called off support for Al Nusra and their allies there. And that the whole the whole part of working on that regime change, that part of the policy was wound down from that point. You might remember the headline in the Washington Post should be famously was in move sure to please Va Vladimir Putin. Course, Trump course. calls off support for the Syrian rebels. Um, so, but that, but, but that doesn't mean that the U.S. has not turned a blind eye to Saudi support for the Syrian rebels. Yeah, which has which continued. I, which, I, uh -huh. which I suspect is, I, I very much suspect is the, uh, is the case. Mm -hmm. Except... Well, so, I mean, I don't know if there even is really a policy on this question, um, but it seems like if there was one, it would have to be that, look, the war is over. We're going to stand back and go ahead and let the Syrian government take back the no, Idlib no, no. province. And these fighters are going to have to go to prison somewhere or they're going to have to get jobs in Turkey or something. But are we really just going to let there be... You know, this little mini Islamic state in the Idlib province forever, and we're going to take Turkey's side in continuing to back it even now? Yes, when Turkey, when Turkey invaded uh, Syria in 2018, it did so with explicit U.S. support. Well, and they did it. I mean, it can't be, but I, I, I agree with you. But that it's was like, against no, the Kurds, right, really when they're taking Afrin and all that? But that's that already was, done. That was against the Kurds, but it was explicitly there were there were there were is, Islamist rebels uh, who were who were who took part in that invasion. Oh yeah, sure. So, so it's 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 implicitly in behalf of the Al Qaeda led rebels. Yeah, uh, and so. Uh, that, but I guess I just don't understand why the Turks still need them. They got what they they got Afrin. They got as much as they're ever going to get from Assad as far as weakening him, and that much is over. Well, under the um, under the Astana Accords, the Astana is the uh, is the city in um, I'm sorry, I should know this, Uzbekistan, I believe, where uh, where peace talks were conducted and under Russian auspices. Uh, um, 
Turkey was allowed to maintain a temporary control over Id Idlib if it agreed mm -hmm. to separate the so-called moderate forces from the al Qaeda forces and get rid of the latter. Now that's like you know, that's like trying to that's that's like putting sugar in your coffee and then trying to pick the crystals out. Um, so you know, but so it's meaningless. But the point is, is, is that is that Turkey never never undertook that project. And that is that is now serious justification for going to war to get the entire rebel force out of its territory. Hey, guys, Scott Horton here for Mike Swanson's great book, The War State. It's about the rise of the military industrial complex and the power elite after World War II during the administrations of Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower and Jack Kennedy. It's a very enlightening take on this definitive era on America's road to world empire. The War State by Mike Swanson. Find it in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org. Hey, y'all. Mike Swanson is a successful Wall Street trader with an Austrian school understanding of the markets, and therefore he has great advice to share with you. Check out Mike's work and sign up for his list at wallstreetwindow.com. And that's what you'll get, a window into all of Mike's trades. He'll explain what he's buying and selling and expecting and why. I know you'll learn and earn a lot. WallStreetWindow.com. That's WallStreetWindow.com. All right, so now the Turks have killed over 50 Syrian troops. Jason has written at Antiwar.com, News.Antiwar.com there. And as you say, um, the Russians launched some strikes against the Turks in response. And I guess they have sort of a temporary ceasefire now as far as that goes. Um the Turks are vowing they're not leaving, and the Syrians are vowing that they're going to finish this job. So it certainly is and, not over yet. And the Turks and the Turks are are vowing to step up their effort. So 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 both sides are escalating, which means that uh, that the conflict is escalating. And America's on the side of Abu Muhammad Al Jolani, who is blood oath sworn loyal to Ayman Al Zawahiri, the butcher of New York City. Yes, yes, yes. This is this is. I mean, why? I mean, why aren't people rioting in the streets? I mean, I, I mean, you know, I, is it was it really so long ago that the twin towers came crashing down, killing oh, nearly three thousand people, uh, and now and now the U.S. is essentially aiding the same elements. Uh, I, I just, I mean, is, is the are Americans asleep at the wheel? I mean, not only that, but. You know, they were the worst part of the Sunni insurgency in Iraq War II, where, you know, 4,000 out of the 4,500 Americans that were killed in Iraq War II, uh, well, it was more than that if you include the contractors, but of the American soldiers, they died fighting the Sunni insurgency. And in many cases, it was the Al-Qaeda and Iraq guys, the suicide bombers and, and Zarqawi's men who were the, the leading edge of that uh, for a couple of years there anyway. America has been on the side of Al Qaeda or proto Al Qaeda since 1980, uh, and it just can't quit. Uh, and as as the conflict with Iran heats up, uh, the more the more the U.S. falls into the arms of the Saudi Al Qaeda uh, Turkish, you know, uh, broad alliance. Hey, just one year ago, there was a truck bombing against the Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran that they blamed on Saudi and America, quite credibly. It yeah. was Al-Qaeda that did it. So that means Washington, D.C. Yeah. Just like the Reagan yeah. years, like all the all their turning on us never happened. Hey, they're still useful against our enemies. So who cares? Our real yeah. enemies, the states that stand in our way. Dana Rohrabacher, the uh, the former uh, uh, Republican congressman from Southern California, who's been in the news lately uh, because of uh, Julian Assange, at a hearing in Congress, act, Congress actually said, "Well, shouldn't we support ISIS <laughs> if they're going after if they're going after Iran?" There you go. And he that was, was their thing. He was he was shouted down merely merely because he was stupid enough to say out loud. What everyone else was smart enough to whisper onto their breath. Yeah, except for the Israelis who were happy to say it out loud over and over again, including Michael Oren, their ambassador to the United States. Yeah, yes, he did actually. 
yeah. he actually did say that uh, that ISIS was preferable to Assad. Yeah. Uh, but um, yes, uh, it, no, it's I mean Scott, it's it's really it, it, it's it's funny in one sense, but it's it's horrifying in another sense. Uh, I mean, essentially, the U.S. government is still in league with the forces that killed 3,000 people in Lower Manhattan, uh, a scant uh, uh, 18 or 19 years ago. Uh, yeah. That that crime has never been investigated, and in fact, the U.S. is on the side of the perpetrators, and that should horrify any American who expects justice or who expects democratic representation from his own government. I mean, yeah. his, his own government should not be lining up with the people who are killing him. Does that make sense to you? So, uh, so Sounds right to uh, me. Yes. So, so that's not what we the people don't want our government to kill, to, to kill us. So, yeah. you know, but, but yet that's what's happening. And this is uh, only my second interview of the day about America fighting on the side of al-Qaeda. Previously, it was Nasser Arabi reporting out of Sana'a, Yemen, where America is still fighting on the side of AQAP. Yeah. And the UAE there. But anyways, so let's talk about uh, Erdogan, the sort of pseudo kind of dictator of uh, Turkey here. Um, he's an Islamist, not exactly a Muslim Brotherhood type, right? Where's he come from? No, he's a, he, I, I would describe him as Muslim Brotherhood light. Yeah. Uh, he is a uh, he is a mild Islamist. And you must remember, if you go back uh, 15 years uh, he was celebrated by everyone from George W. Bush to the New York Times as the as the good side of you know of, of as the as the person who represented democratic Islam. Uh, I mean, uh, W. praised him to the skies. The New York Times couldn't couldn't keep writing favorable story you know couldn't write more favorable stories about him. Uh, he was he was really the great white hope. He was the way he was the good alternative to uh, to Al Qaeda. Um, and uh, uh, as time has gone on, uh, uh, Erdogan has just turned uh, darker and darker. Um, and um, and the Syria adventure is, you know, is uh, has been a major factor in this uh, in this development mm -hmm. because uh, Syria, uh, you know, uh, has essentially had the effect of dragging Erdogan into this great morass. And the more the more he was dragged into it, the more his dark side came out. The more he found himself al aligning himself with with really dark Sunni chauvinist elements, and therefore, you know, uh, revealing uh, more about himself in that regard as well. Mm. So, uh, so, so, um, Erdogan is on the offensive now. He um, he recently traveled to uh, to Pakistan, gave a gave a major speech before a joint session of parliament, in which he. Uh, um, in which he uh, essentially kind of, you know, lauded the uh, uh, Muslims in ca neighboring Kashmir uh, as, you know, fellow Muslim brothers, uh, and pledged his solidarity on the basis of a common Islam, which is extremely provocative, and just about the last thing that region needs. And he also has inserted forces into uh, into Libya in behalf of the Islamist Islamist backed. Uh, general National uh, um, Administration, I believe it's called the GNA, um, which is uh, which is uh, essentially is ensconced in central AAA. Uh, but he's uh, you know he's sort of carrying this kind of uh, soft jihad uh, farther and farther. It seems um, like and such a half-assed operation, though. You know, there was a time when his asset Abu Bakr al Baghdadi had seized Mosul and declared the Islamic Caliphate and all that, it seems like that would have been the perfect time. He has all these bin Ladenites to do all the dying for him, to push the front line all the way to Baghdad and all the way to Erbil or, you know, the river outside of Erbil. And then that would have been the perfect time for Erdogan and his army to ride in and say, this is now greater Turkey and I'm the Sultan and I'm the Caliph and I'm the boss around here, not Baghdadi, and expand Turkey's borders then. It seems like all this effort, but for what? He hasn't, well, what's he even getting out of this? Well, he's, well first of all, number one is that Baghdadi had declared himself the, uh, the, the caliph, and so we would have had two rival caliphs. Uh, yeah, but Erdogan what, what, was, when it comes what, to military power, Erdogan's forces could have whooped the Islamic State and taken right over Mosul, no problem, right? 
that's true, but Islamic State is, you know, is, it was, is a force to be reckoned with as well, or it was until recently. Um, but, he could have uh, just but, increased their salaries, and it would have worked okay. That's true. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but Erdogan is a, um, is a, is a, uh, is a neo-Ottoman. I remember for 500 years, 500 years or 400 years, actually, the, the caliphate was based in Istanbul. In, uh, Istanbul. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Um, I mean, I really thought, honestly, in 2013, I'm like, well, you know, he's he's essentially using all these bin Ladenites to soften up all of his enemies and to expand as much territory as he can. And then he's going to expand his territory. He's going to he wants to be the sultan. But then he never seemed to really go for it. I don't know why he didn't. Well, because he's working up to it gradually. But remember, uh, if he expands his um, his sultanate. Uh, he essentially expands it in two directions. One is towards the Arab world uh, in Syria, uh, Iraq, and, uh, and North Africa. But the other direction is towards, uh, towards Turkish Central Asia. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, and so therefore, uh, you know, therefore he, uh, he has um, lurking in the back of Erdogan's mind are some pretty considerable imperial ambitions. Uh, you know, so that seems to be what he's heading towards now. This yeah. course is well. Is there, is, there is, by the way, there happens to be the completely unresolved matter of Western Iraqi Sunnistan, and so somebody's going to be the dominant force there. Maybe the clean break will come true after all, and it'll be a Jordanian-Turkish-Israeli alliance that dominates Iraqi Sunnistan. Right. But, uh, but, sure, yeah, but, is a but long course, way around to what Worms are saying would happen. But anyway, but but of course, these imperial ambitions greatly outweigh his his real power. So so what's going to happen is that the more he acts on these ambitions, the greater the chance is going to fall flat in his face, as he is already doing in Syria, because he can't win this war in Syria. Yeah. Well, and talk about Libya too. I mean, he's really expanded a whole other mission there. Yeah, and it's as I as I said in my antiwar dot com article, it's a it's a classic case of a of a rat, you know, fleeing to a a sinking ship rather than away away from it. I mean, yeah. uh, the, uh, the the GNA and uh, barely controls central Libya, central Tripoli, much less the the vast you know the vast portion of of uh, of Libya outside the city limits. It it can't win. Uh, it, it has doesn't have a friend in the world. It's allied with the most extreme Islamist elements, uh, and that is not to say that that Hiftar, the uh, the warlord, the uh, the the American Libyan warlord, lord, uh, who is uh, waging war against the GNA. I'm not saying he is any better by any means, but the GNA itself is a is a, a regime that's that's definitely going to go down into defeat. So, with amazing accuracy. Uh, Erdogan has chosen the losing party in this conflict, <laughs> and that can't well end well either. So he's uh, he's he's heading for disaster on two fronts. Yeah, you know it's funny that uh, I wonder how isolated he is in his own little information bubble or what. After how difficult the going has been in Syria this whole time, in terms of actually accomplishing any of his goals. That he would just imagine somehow that Libya will be a pushover. Uh, I don't know what got got him thinking that way. I remember, you know, he, he's ensconced in his uh, he has an eleven hundred room presidential complex outside of uh, uh, Ankara. So I imagine he like he roams the corridors <laughs> like a figure out of a Gabriel Garcia Garcia Marquez novel, mm. you know, sort of talking to himself. And, you know, and, and, and just sort of wondering, you know, that he's absolutely positive he can prevail in Libya and Syria when, of course, the reality is is directly contrary because uh, he can't win there. He's going to he's going to wind up with a bloody nose. Mm-hmm. And and domestically, his power is 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 ebbing away. Uh, he lost a huge battle back in June for control of Istanbul against a, against a center leftist party. Uh, so he lost that battle. Uh, the economy is doing extremely poorly. Uh, political support is ebbing away. So he's um, he's losing it on all sides. Mm-hmm. All right. So now, just exactly how consistent are his policies lately with U.S. goals in the region? Because I read a lot about tension, but I wonder if the Americans really mind any of this. 
It's a mess. And the U.S., you know, I mean, does the U.S. have any idea what its goals are in the Middle East? I, I mean, the U.S. is the, the I mean, I've never seen a more confused policy than what we're seeing now out of the out of the Trump administration. I mean, somehow it it um, it it uh, it it it's trying to maintain control of the oil fields in eastern Syria. Uh, it's uh, half at war with the government in Iraq. Uh, it's it's sword rattling toward uh, toward Iran, uh, seemingly provoking it at every turn, but yet at the same time, clearly afraid of a major war breaking out. Uh, it's deeply in bed with uh, Mohammed bin, Sa- bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, whose government is really just, uh, as far as I'm concerned, hanging by a thread. Also, uh, uh, the U.S. is just it's just has got itself tied up in knots. Uh, I mean, Trump is friendly to Russia on one hand. He's afraid to alienate uh, Erdogan too strongly. On the other hand, uh, he's you know he supports one one moment, another another moment. He doesn't have a a clue as to what the hell he's doing, really. Yeah, man. Well, that sure sounds right to me. <laughs> we have this entire self-generated crisis <laughs> with Iran right when we didn't have one at all. Right when everything was I mean, fine. Hey, you know what? Honestly, if Trump had really wanted to put teeth in that nuclear deal, I think if he had just treated the Iranians with respect and said, man, you know what? Over here, we really want to lift those sunsets and go ahead and keep some of those limits a little bit longer, guys. What do you say? I think he could have negotiated that. <laughs> I think he would have gotten exactly what he wanted if he'd stayed within the deal and said, you know what, before I got here, the last guy went ahead and, you know, opened the door. So what the hell am I going to do? Reverse that? Let's see what we can do to work it out. And that means, and hell, even adding missiles. You know what, let's limit your range to just outside Dimona. I bet you could have got them to sign up on that, you know? Yes, but Israel would have said no. Israel would have said, he would have, would have halted him in his tracks. And it's not that Israel is all powerful. It's that Trump has, you know, has, has made it his duty to cater to, to, uh, to Netanyahu's every last whim and, and then some. Yeah. So, uh, so, it's Adelson so, who's all powerful. That's what it is. And so, so, so Trump, so Trump couldn't, couldn't, re- couldn't reach any halfway reasonable accord with, the, with Iran Without, without, uh, you know, infuriating the Israelis and also alienating uh, Mohammed bin, Sal- bin Salman in a, in a, in Saudi Arabia. So the U.S. has gotten itself into a pickle, yeah. and it's you know, and it doesn't know how to get out, and and it, it thrashes about, and everything gets worse and worse as a consequence, and the situation is just blowing up. It's a, it's just you know, it's 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 you know, it's a lot of it is Trump's fault, but it really is. The culmination of seventy or eighty years of just ongoing U.S. incompetence, uh, and you know, and so it's not all Trump's fault. No, certainly not. Except, just like with Obama or any of these guys, I mean, you got to realize going in, if you've already lived to your forties, fifties, sixties, etc., then you already know how quick eight years goes. You have eight years to be the guy in the chair whose shot it is to call, you don't really have to go along with what the Israelis say. Not if you play your cards right. Uh, they all just... <laughs> the U.S. The U.S. Israeli alliance, the U.S. Israeli Saudi alliance goes very, very deep. I mean, we saw what happened to Trump when Trump uh, talked about a rapprochement with, uh, with Russia. He was, uh, he was almost driven out of office. Yep. Uh, and uh, and believe me, uh, I mean Israel uh, has its uh, hooks deep into America's soul, and it's not because of Jewish money or you know or uh, or the the uh, elders of Zion or any other of that nonsense. It's because the U.S. you know threw in its lot with uh, Israel from the very beginning, and then Israel you know established itself in 1967 as the dominant military power in the Middle East. And the U.S. from that point on just couldn't say no. So since then, the uh, U.S.-Israeli alliance has uh, has just gotten deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's one that that no president uh, 
to date has Dare walked away from. We'll see what happens if Bernie Sanders uh, yeah. gets into the White House. And I we'll think the money has a lot to do with it, and it's certainly not so broad as Jewish money, because after all, most American Jews are liberals and support peace. Um, but Sheldon Adelson gives $100 million every two years to the Republican Party. And without that the, money, they lose. With that money is, comes obligations to his priorities. And his priorities are straight, direct Likud policy, you know, out of Israel. He supports the pro-Likud paper there. He's on the record saying America should have dropped a demonstration, atom bomb in the desert outside of Tehran to show them what's coming up to them next if they don't bow down to our every demand, etc. And but, but but this is a relatively new phenomenon. There wasn't big money uh, until about a decade ago. Before then, Israel was not a big spender. It was not like the Saudis, you know, do, you know doling out you know tens of millions of dollars, you know, to everyone from a from the Atlantic Council to a, to the uh, the Clinton Foundation. Uh, the uh, Israelis did, did not dole out big money, but they still they still had vast support. Through you know, in academia, among Republicans and Democrats, uh, the press, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, it was you know, hard cold cash played a fairly secondary role. Yeah, well, and especially after the Cold War, when it became more necessary, they used to yeah. have a narrative that we really, really needed them. Now they're trying to find excuses, and so yeah. that's a little bit more expensive. Yep. But anyways, um, all right. Well, listen, um, I really appreciate the fact that you are writing for Antiwar.com, a regular column now for us. And uh, the previous article, which maybe we'll catch up on this topic uh, sometime soon, is called Tactical Nukes, Armageddon on the Installment Plan, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. They've been deployed now, these low-yield nukes. And so we'll definitely have to catch up on that. But this one is uh, Erdogan's excellent Syrian adventure. Thanks again, Dan. Great. Thanks, Scott. The Scott Horton Show and Anti-War Radio can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.